The bridge was neither long nor wide. A simple wooden structure spans the narrow but deep chasm between the disappointments of the past and the uncertainty of the future. Let me introduce myself. I'm Lyle Jetterman. I'm 38 now. A man who previously differed from other men only in that he was the husband of Gloria, 36 years old, and the father of Robert, 12 years old, and Anna, 8 years old. A very pleasant family picture, but with a significant financial burden. To fulfill my responsibilities as a husband and father, I worked at Countryman Realtor for five years before Gabriel Zelo purchased the company from Bernie Schleifer. Real estate was not my initial career or even my desired choice. I began my career after graduating from law school. By that time, I had been married to Gloria for three years. She was pregnant when I graduated from law school. It wasn't a very promising job market for young lawyers, but Gloria's pregnancy gave me a strong incentive to find a job that could support my family. The first job I was offered was working for a law firm that specializes in representing banks in closing home loans. It wasn't the job I dreamed of, but it was a job. While I was in law school, Gloria worked as a bank teller to support both of us. She earned enough to pay the rent and feed us. I worked a few part-time hours, doing whatever I could to supplement her income. Loans and scholarships paid for my education, but I connected my future with the Department of Education. Since Gloria apparently became pregnant during my law school graduation, I accepted the job offer. This was only the first of many concessions to the strict demands of married life. Back in those ancient times, banks lent money to individual home buyers to purchase houses. In retrospect, it was the profession of a gentleman lawyer. I sat at the house flipping desk to represent the lending bank at the mortgage closing. The buyer paid the bank a commission of about $500 for my services. The law firm received this amount plus another $500 from the insurance company. Everything was talking about a solid $1,000 earned every time we shook hands at the end of the house. The company, of course, received money, and I received a tiny part of it as a salary. I think all good things must come to an end, and honest stinginess must be replaced by bad and pure greed. Shortly after my wife Gloria gave birth to our second child, small banks were swallowed up by big banks which, in turn, were swallowed up by even bigger banks. Retail loans are a thing of the past. Banking became a wholesale trade. Everything was brought to an industrial level. Every morning I would arrive at work to find a stack of paperwork for mortgages that were supposed to close that day. I guess the profits were huge, but running between rooms where simultaneous house closings were happening left me with an uneasy feeling that things couldn't go on at this rate forever. In the seven years of my legal career, I have progressed not to partnership, but to the high status of a private contractor. I earned it by piece. At $75 per closing, I was making a decent income considering I was closing seven or eight loans a day, five and sometimes six days a week. But can this continue for long? I had this nagging feeling of impending doom. Bernard Schliefer approached me. Bernie, as he preferred to be called, was looking for what he called a smart guy with a law degree to join his company. His main contract was soon retiring to the Sun Belt, just as Bernie wanted to expand. Bernie's company, Countryman Real Estate, held shares in the Scarlet Woods development. This development consisted of 100 approved lots, and the site plan called for another 400. It was two miles from the Techno Park with the International Foundry. 2,000 high-tech jobs were mapped out on the drawing board, and Bernie was ready. Schliefer was a builder-developer. He was neither a salesman nor a small business financier. If you needed to raise a couple of million by selling your growth dream to a banker, Bernie was your man. But he couldn't sell anything to a housewife with the addition of a real stone countertop or to her husband with a variable rate mortgage. Oddly enough, when Bernie and I met, everything was perfect. I enjoyed selling houses and was a detail person. It was all about these rustling paper documents of delivery. I also learned the value of profit centers from my former employers. I increased Bernie's sales by the amount sold by his own company, 
home insurance agents, movers, gardeners, and so on. We quickly became a full-service agency with a single purpose. Our function was to sell more houses and get everything we could from everything that came with them. Bernie started building and he did it very quickly. I ran to the office and everything. Bernie did the big deals and I did the little ones. He made a lot of money and I was his well-paid employee. He saw the approaching disaster. Bear Stearns was the tip of the iceberg. The investment bank Lehman Brothers was the ship that actually hit the iceberg. The day the roof fell in, Bernie was smiling. What goes up must come down, but real estate will always rise again. If we can survive this within reasonable limits, we will be ready for great expansion. Bernie bet the market would come back. I buckled down and squeezed out every last cent, which he then invested in bigger and better country properties. Bernie only had one problem with it. He was a big fish in a small pond, and he wanted to go for a swim in the ocean. One evening over drinks after work, he broke the news. I sold everything, he said. What? Calm down. The new owner won't change anything. At least not right away. Bernie was right again. When I met Gabe Zillow, my first impression was of his youth. He was not yet 30, and he managed to buy Bernie out. He was taller and younger than me, and he was a handsome, blonde Adonis the very image of a business prodigy superstar. I probably should have been jealous of the young man, but he was too charming and affable to be indignant. It was great working for him, too. Bernie was approaching 50. He was ambitious, but essentially cautious. In contrast, Gabe loved to put everything out there for everyone to see. Everything is on the line, all the time. It was obvious from the beginning that his deal to buy a country property had drained Gabe's resources. Gabe was more of a financier than a builder, more of a manager than a salesman. He loved quick money, and when the real estate market returned, his bet on the countryman was clearly paying dividends. Bernie was flying to Florida, to a large real estate casino. The night before leaving, I wished him luck. Come with me, baby, he said. No, because I'm not a child anymore. I have a wife and two teenagers to support, I said. Okay but someday you will regret it. I hoped not, but I checked the job market. There's not much left of my old company. Stephen Pender, one of the junior partners, managed to hold out during the collapse. He was glad to hear me, but he paid me a third of what I was now earning. So I put my nose to the wheel to make sure the countryman stayed afloat. But overall, I was happy working for Gabe, as we called him. He treated me well and let me pretty much run the office day to day. Did I have any doubts about him? Yes, but my only dissatisfaction with the boss was minor. Bernie never hosted a formal Christmas party. Gabe went to the opposite extreme. He hired one of the best vacation spots in Saratoga. True, in the off-season, but still for a lot of money. The next party on the first Saturday in December was for staff, contractors, bankers, and realtors. It was a big, fancy party, and there were a lot of guests. Gabe ruled her like a king. Well, it was his money and perhaps there was a legitimate business purpose for it all. My dissatisfaction came around midnight, but it grew throughout the night. You see, I arrived with the hottest woman in this place on my arm. I married Gloria right after college. We were both barely 22. She worked a dead-end job to support us all while I was in law school. I will be forever grateful to her for this, but she brought on her own pregnancy by going off the pill while I studied for the bar exam Pregnancy may have been for the better in the long run. We were good parents, and still are. While I was struggling with renting houses, Gloria was raising our kids and working at night to get her doctorate in child psychology. When our youngest child returned to school, Gloria returned to work. She found a job at the State Department. She also started what I now call her running career. Gloria could be called chubby. She was fat compared to some starved models. But at age 30, she went from swimming at the YWCA pool for two days and running just after our kids to running solo long distances. Every morning, my wife got up early to walk five miles cross country. Every evening, she did half an hour of sprinting. She had the fastest time of any local female runner. Only national competitors have beaten her once in local 5K and 10K races. She competed in the New York City Marathon three times, 
finishing in the top 100 women. I'm not a homebody. I go to the gym at least three times a week and bike 20 miles on summer weekends. But I have over 5% body fat, and I don't have a body that looks like it was sculpted by Michelangelo. I supported Gloria in her efforts. I saw her get up before dawn and come back sweating when I woke the children. I was proud of my wife. So when I walked into the Christmas party with this tall, black-haired beauty on my arm, the conversation died down and people turned to see the striking Gloria. She was just over 6'2 in her three-inch heels, just my height. Her raven hair spilled over her shoulders. When she runs, she wears them in a ponytail, which causes applause behind her. That evening, it shimmered in the light of the ballroom lamps. Gloria tried her best to get to the party. She was wearing a new tight black dress. The scallop-trimmed dress showed just a hint of her cleavage and was immodestly short to show off her fabulously long jogger legs. This dress made everyone notice her flat stomach and her sculpted butt. She was the subject of passionate art. My wife was no longer a chubby girl. She was a wonderful woman in my arms. Gabe wasted no time in greeting us and leading Gloria off to dance. Although I admit that they were a lovely couple, he is taller and stronger than me, his attention seemed to cross the line of foul. Just before midnight, he approached her and kissed her passionately under the mistletoe. I'm not jealous. Yes, my wife is hot, but I trust her. We went through many difficult times together, years of law school, raising children, paying off school loans. We survived illness, including miscarriage. I feel sorry for the couples who never fought together. I believe it's the tough times that bring you together and make your marriage strong. Gloria and I experienced everything together and loved each other. Gloria was drinking and clearly enjoying everyone's attention. I chalked it all up to this. I picked up my wife and took her home. Nothing more was said, and she acted as if nothing had happened. I just drank too much, I told myself. Six months later, Memorial Day weekend arrived. The first half of the year was good in the real estate sector. The number of clients has increased significantly. The last week of May was the hottest in the last 10 years. The company's operating account was filled with cash from home sales that was scheduled to be deposited on the first business day of June. We would check the checks and then electronically pay the banks when the office opened after the three-day weekend. Are you coming to camp for the weekend? Gabe asked. Gabe rented a mountain cabin in the Adirondacks for Memorial Day weekend. He hadn't talked about anything else for weeks. His invitation was addressed to Gloria and me, but I wanted to avoid it. I don't know what Gloria's plans are, I said, trying to refuse him. Oh, she's with us, looking forward to it. I looked at him questioningly. We spoke on the phone, he said hastily. Why didn't I believe him? But when he left, I called Gloria, and yes, she was delighted. I believe this was the last moment to stop the train wreck. But I just didn't see it. I both loved Gloria and trusted her. MapQuest told me that the ride to Gabe's house would not be easy. I drove my Honda Accord to the rental place and picked up a four-wheel drive SUV. According to the map, the last 20 miles were on mountain roads and the last three on dirt roads. I've been to the Adirondack Mountains before. They can be very brutal mountains. Gabe's home was southwest of Saranac Lake. The journey took almost four hours. The GPS only showed the last five miles. We turned off the beltway onto the last two miles of semi-paved road that ended at a wooden bridge. The bridge was narrow but looked strong. Recently renovated, it crossed a ravine. The gap was not very wide but deep. This type of terrain is common in the Adirondack Mountains. Difficult terrain is the reason they remain wild. I slowly crossed the bridge, wondering if there was another exit, although the GPS map didn't show one. I had the feeling of a mouse caught in a mouse trap. I wonder if there is a cat here. Three miles down a rutted dirt road, we came to a two-story house. It was built on a clearing on the side of a mountain about a thousand feet below the summit. A dozen Adirondack peaks were visibly to the north. We reached a remote location where what must have looked like a rustic cabin had been built. I parked the SUV in a well-maintained parking lot next to three comparable, albeit much more expensive-looking vehicles. Everything looked new and carefully cared for. The cabin itself was one of those modern log buildings that just looks rustic. 
They are decorated in a modern style with traditional paneling. A large, comfortable, modern building pretending to be a 19th century mountain retreat. The impression was vivid. Gabe went overboard again to produce it. I had no doubt who he wanted to impress, and it wasn't me. They greeted us on the wide porch with its Adirondack chairs and accompanying decor. There were six of them, three young men, Gabe, and two of his college friends. Ken Lewis was the shortest at about 5 of 10 in, but built like a weightlifter. He was approaching 30, like Gabe. Ken was starting to go bald, and his face wasn't as handsome as Gabe's, but he was physically covered in muscles that showed through his tight T-shirt and shorts. Glenn Sachs was the second college buddy. About six feet tall, thin, with curly blonde hair, he looked better than Ken. He stood holding the blonde woman tightly in his arms. She was introduced as Sharon. She was a beautiful woman with curvaceous figures and a full bust. She must have been at least 30, maybe older. A good eight to ten years older than Glenn. A slightly younger woman named Robin stood next to Ken and was clearly with him. She was a short, bubbly brunette in her early thirties, and very well built, with breasts that seemed too large for her small body. The last of the group was a tall woman with long brown hair. It was Paula Henry, one of those women who, for lack of a better word, are called beautiful. Definitely a woman with attractive but sharp, not entirely feminine features. Her appearance showed that she was smart. She knew it, and so did others. She was clearly the youngest of the women and was a school friend of the boys. Everyone was very friendly and overly happy that we made it. But this greeting was not ordinary. Gabe clearly greeted my wife, greeted me like an afterthought, and his friend Paula glared at me the way one would look at a laboratory animal before dissecting it. They arranged dinner for us, so we just quickly threw our bag into our assigned bedroom on the second floor. Our small room was next to the master's, which Gabe occupied. We all sat down in the great hall, massive 40 by 40 foot living room, dining room, and game room. Here, at the large oak table, we feasted on gourmet microwave meals. The food was good but effortless and expensive. Wine was served in large quantities. I observed my drinking as much as you can if your host is constantly trying to refill your glass. After dinner, the crowd sat around the gas fireplace on the terrace. Strong drinks and marijuana appeared there. It was clear that this would be a weekend of drinking and light drug use. I began to examine my situation through careful questioning and keen observation. On the surface, I was attending a normal holiday weekend with my boss, two of his friends, and their girlfriends. However, everything looked more cunning. Just a few minutes later, it turned out that Robin had a fiancé somewhere, but not here, and Sharon was married with two children and a husband at home. Sharon and Robin worked together, and allegedly enjoyed a girls-only weekend at the spa together. Treason was treated casually and with humor. Paula did not take her eyes off me and did not seem to be part of this group. You'd think she was with Gabe, but she wasn't offended by his open flirting with my wife. In fact, he spent most of the night sitting between Gloria and Paula. Gabe continued to talk mostly to Gloria, my attempts to engage Paula in conversation were met with only polite interest. She sent me signals not to do anything. Around midnight, I sensed that the pleasantly excited guests were ready to retire to their bedrooms to conclude the evening's festivities, but they were waiting for something. Suddenly, Gabe turned to me and said, Lyle, you must be tired from your long drive. Yes, dear. Why don't you go to bed and I'll join you a little later, said my Gloria. Damn it, not until I've had another drink, I said, grabbing the bottle. Unless you take it, Gabe. I smiled at him as I said this, but internally, I cursed this pig who tried to seduce my wife. I also wondered what Gloria was playing at. She spent the whole evening with him, like at a Christmas party. Is she really in love? Has my 16-year-old wife fallen in love with my boss? It was a waiting game that night, but I won it. Eventually, Gloria went into the bedroom with me. In our assigned room, Gloria slipped into the shower alone. I didn't try to join her. It didn't make any sense. She acted a little cold towards me. When she came out of the shower, I slipped past her to rinse off too. 
I expected to find her under the covers when I came out, but she was sitting naked on the edge of the bed. Please, she said, patting the bed next to her. As I sat down, she turned to me and said, I want to have fun this weekend. Life has been hard, but I've worked really hard and I think I deserve a break. I don't have any problems with this. You were a wonderful wife and mother during difficult times. You sent me to law school and raised my children on my meager salary while I went back to school. You worked hard to earn the amazing body you have, and you still contribute more than your share to our home. I'm proud to be your husband. I was awakened by the morning light streaming through the open blinds of the large bedroom window. Gloria was usually up long before I went for my morning run. But her generosity with alcohol and weed last night had an effect. I got out of bed, closed the curtains, and entered the small bathroom with a shower. It was a small bedroom, but more than adequate in its amenities. I showered, shaved, and went downstairs before anyone else. I decided to look around before the others got out of bed. I moved from the great room to a patio with a fire pit and built-in outdoor BBQ. The patio opened onto a raised terrace with a small pool and sauna. Open water seemed like a risky proposition in the spring in these notoriously cold mountains. But as I climbed onto the terrace, I realized that the entire complex was heated. The higher side of the mountain was covered with solar panels, so the pool was heated, and probably the house too. Walking across the terrace, I came to what appeared to be a small barn. There were no animals, but it was filled to capacity with ATVs, snowmobiles, and gardening equipment, including several small tractors. Passing by this building, I heard the sound of a small stream in the distance. The stream flowed about twenty yards behind a locked barn with a small chimney in the roof. Looking through one small window, I saw a generator and fuel tanks. In this way, gasoline was stored for sports vehicles and a generator for emergencies. Someone took care of everything. This place was an isolated world. Obviously, it was ready for any eventuality. The stream was small and shallow. I thought I was too small for the fish until I saw one jump out of the small stream. Are you fishing? A voice said from behind me. Startled, I turned around and saw Paula behind me. No, but when I was younger and had more time. It's a shame, but this might give you something to do this weekend. Do you fish? No, like you, you don't have time. How about breakfast and a walk up the mountain? It seems like a waste of time to come all this way and never reach the top, she said. Paula placed the coffee in the stainless steel coffee maker. The kitchen pantry was stocked with microwave ready breakfast. I chose instant oatmeal, as did my companion. No one else has woken up yet. They'll probably all sleep late. How about a hike? She said, smiling. Paula obviously knew where the trail started because she led us straight to it. The summit didn't seem that far away, but an hour later it seemed just as far away as when we started. Are you sure you want to go upstairs? I asked. Why? You gave up, old man, she said. I just wonder what the others will think when they don't find us. Don't worry, I doubt your absence will bother them. Finally, we reached the top, and judging by the fact that the sun was almost directly overhead, it was approaching noon. The top of the mountain was a little disappointing. It was a fairly flat area with rounded edges. Two ancient wooden benches were positioned to face east, towards the gatehouse, and several peaks to the south and east. The fog obscured the distant view, although the air seemed fresh and clean. There was a cool breeze at midday, but nothing unpleasant. My companion sat down, clearly deciding to enjoy the view. Do you mind? She said. I would like to rest before going down. No, the old man could use a break, I said. This made me smile. So, Glenn is a broker, Ken is a banker, and Gabe is a developer. But we talked all night, and I never heard what you do. She looked at me appraisingly. Apparently, she was deciding what the harm was. I'm an inspector. I work for the government. The job is low-paid and very boring, she said. Have you ever inspected anyone we know? Oh, not lately. When we were in college, it seemed like I was always needed to help the kids. 
You know, covering them from an angry girlfriend or providing cheat sheets for exams. They were always on the edge. This is what makes them who they are. You know, extraordinary young people. So this is your job? Are you covering for them? What's the use of closing the barn door after the horse has gone out? This won't help you get your horse back. Rules only hold things back. It's better if smart people raise their hands and the rest are pushed aside to make way. The best thing is that in the end, everyone benefits according to their own merits. So, what is your task for this weekend? It seems like you didn't attend the party last night, I said. She fell silent, as if the question had taken her by surprise. I stood up and walked to the side where I could see the road leading down the mountain. There was no other way, only one way out, the only way out. I turned and glared at Paula. Has she thought about this? The rest were, as I realized in a moment of gestalt, completely blind to everything except their own physical appetites. But is it? Obviously, she was looking. She must see the problem the same way I do. I'm just here as a designated teetotaler. I make sure everything is going well, that nothing untoward is happening. Any problems are rejected. I don't want to interfere unless absolutely necessary. You mean unless the Golden Boys need you? I don't think I would put it that way, but I can certainly see what's best for them, for everyone, in the long run. Should we go downstairs? I asked. What a rush. The way back will be faster. Yes, faster, but the slope is steep and maybe more dangerous. You can fall hard. Why bother when you're at the top? She said, but she got up and began to descend. We arrived at the lodge without incident, but my misgivings grew stronger. We found the rest by the pool. I have never seen my wife in a black bikini. Her body was amazingly exposed with a small amount of material. The other women were a little better. As Paula and I approached, I saw my wife sitting on Gabe's lap, giving him a deep, sensual kiss. We're back, Paula shouted, causing Gabe and Gloria to break the kiss. Gabe grinned like a bad little boy who had been caught stealing cookies but knew he wouldn't be punished. My wife's smile was too wide and obviously fake. Hey, where have you been? She said, as if she were talking to some random friend. An awkward silence followed. I felt my fists clench. But then Paula grabbed my hand. Well, we obviously missed lunch, and since we made it to the top of the mountain, we deserve some food, Paula said, dragging me towards the cabin. As we left the pool, I heard muffled laughter. I don't know what Paula has prepared. If I ate, I don't remember. She forced a black Johnny Walker on me. It was straight and burned my throat. Think before you act, she said. It's just one weekend in a good marriage, and you need to think about your family. When we returned to the pool, the couples were already settled in the jacuzzi. The men laughed, the women giggled. My wife was still sitting on Gabe's lap. I didn't see his or her hands underwater, but I assumed they were both occupied. They were passing around a joint, and it was clear that everyone was high. Paula took a position where she could watch and where she was positioned between the jacuzzi and me. I pretended to drink more and then definitely walked away. I poured the glass when I was out of sight. It's a strange feeling of jealousy mixed with excitement. On the one hand, I was proud of my wife, but on the other, I was very disappointed. She worked long and hard to transform herself from the chubby girl I married. She was now a beautiful, athletic woman, and rightfully desirable. Was proud that men wanted nothing more than to slip into the arms of her strong and loving arms. But what happened to her soul while she was building this fabulous body? Seeing her with Gabe was oddly sexy. I could imagine these perfect bodies united in intercourse, a nightmarish vision, both terrifying and exciting. I wandered around the grounds of the lodge, observing how everything worked, killing time and dreading where everything seemed to be going, understanding that ultimately I may have to be in full control of my options. I walked into our bedroom, deliberately forcing myself to try to sleep. As I lay there, trying to calm my thoughts, the question of why my wife was flirting and kissing another man haunted me. We have lived through so many difficult times together, our early poverty, the illnesses that afflicted our children, and the endless pressure to make ends meet on a middle-class budget. We were just starting to climb to a safe and comfortable place, 
The children reached the age when they could take care of themselves. My wife had a good, if modest, career. Now, after so many lean years, I was making good money. Our debts were in hand and our future was bright. Why give that up for someone as empty and vain as Gabe Zillow? There was nothing hidden behind the charm and brash bravado. Take away the flashy exterior and there's nothing underneath. Gabe has never designed a site plan, built a home, or sold a home. He was the head of a business that was run by others. He was a rich man, a rich kid, a prodigy who came from nowhere, whose only asset was the image of himself. What was Gloria thinking? She said she just wanted to have fun this weekend. Was it fun, and how will it end? I was really asleep, and when I went down the stairs again, they had already moved into the large room. Lunch must have come and gone. The drinks were still flowing, and the joints were passing by. Gloria was back in Gabe's lap. There was no pretending that they hadn't kissed. The bikini tops were removed from all the women, including Paula, who appeared to be sharing Ken with Robin. I walked straight across the room, heading towards the kitchen and food. I was heating up dinner in the microwave when Gloria walked in. How are you? She said. It could have been better, I said. She seemed to hesitate, and then made up her mind. I spent the evening with Gabe, she said. I noticed, I said, when the microwave rang. She smiled strangely when I turned to the microwave. No, I mean tonight in his room. I sat very quietly. I stood with my back to her. It was important that she not see the pain she was causing me at that moment. I see, but what about our 16 years of marriage? That's why I can do this. This is only for the weekend. Next week I'll be all yours again, she said. Oh, and Gaby won't mind? She hugged me from behind, burying her heat in my back. Gabe likes you. He says you two are going somewhere. It's just a fling, a little fun for the weekend. Okay, she asked, and this last word was interspersed with hugs. Can I choose? I asked. Not really, it's decided. I'm just telling you so you know, she said. She let me go and I heard her leave the kitchen. I walked to where the kitchen opened into a large room. They were already at the stairs. As they climbed, Gabe looked back. He smiled at me and gave me a thumbs up as if we were together. He said something in Gloria's ear. She turned around, waved, and smiled at me. I returned to the kitchen. Obviously, everything we went through together meant nothing. My wife left me and humiliated me. I threw food out of the microwave. I made coffee instead. It was going to be a long night. As the water began to boil, I heard someone enter the kitchen. I turned around and saw Paula watching me. I didn't expect there to be caffeine. Wouldn't it be better to drink? She asked. To each his own, I said. But tell me, what is your function here? In response, she shrugged. I'm trying to help. Make sure everything stays calm. How are you going to do this? Sleep with me, she laughed. No, I won't go that far, but don't be discouraged. You'll get your wife back and maybe get a bonus. So, I said, there is money involved. Isn't it always like this? You can't make a fuss because you work for this man. You need to think about your family. What can you do but take what you're given? This is their world, not yours. It's just the way it is. A sharp cry of pleasure was heard from above. Looks like she's having a good time, Paula grinned. Well, that's great. Enjoyable weekend for everyone in the mountains. You know these rocks have been here for a long time. Our existence is just a flash for them. Thousands of years ago, they were covered with thick layers of ice, which combed through them and cut the rivers and gorges that we must now overcome to make our world habitable. Sometimes we forget how precarious our existence is. Take away one small piece and our world will collapse. Only then will we see that it is an illusion. Paula laughed. Oh my God, you're a philosopher. No, just a person who is knowledgeable enough to know what is important. Trying to separate the real and the eternal from illusions. She must have thought I wouldn't cause her any trouble because she left me alone with the coffee and the pain. At about one o'clock in the morning, I went up the stairs. As I passed the door to the master bedroom, I heard loud screams and moans of pleasure from my wife. 
She was always very quiet when we made love, but I think he was better. He was younger and much tougher. The best lover in everything. I assumed that my wife had found the pleasure she was looking for in his bed. I took a shower and changed into my warmest clothes. It will be cold outside. I tried to ignore the noise coming through the walls as I waited. It was already past three o'clock in the morning when silence finally reigned in the house. I waited another thirty minutes and went downstairs. In one of the kitchen cabinets I found a flashlight and candles with matches. A necessary precaution, I suggested, in case harsh reality cut off the electricity. The night was truly dark, the moon had already set. You could hear the night sounds of the mountain, but to a city dweller they seemed like silence itself. I had no trouble finding a barn and a twenty-gallon plastic can of motorsports gas. I also found a wrench. There was a padlock on the generator shed door, but the hinge mechanism was rusted. The wrench made quick work of it. The owners of the house equipped it with a good pump for manually pumping gasoline. Less than ten minutes had passed before the canister was filled with gasoline. It took a few more minutes to walk around the lodge and get to where my rental SUV was parked. I put a can of gasoline in the back, removed the handbrake, and moved the transmission to the drive position. I let the car roll as far down the road as possible before I started it and drove off. As I approached the bridge, I slowed down. I drove along it carefully. When I reached the gravel road, I stopped. I took my time and made sure the gasoline was absorbed into the wood of the bridge. It was a well-made and durable design. It was something carefully made, the work of experienced builders, craftsmen who made good things. Real people built a bridge so that those who live off the sweat of others could have a fun weekend. The fun was coming to an end. I dropped the match. It hissed, then caught fire. The flames rose. Then I retreated. A roaring explosion of heat and fire soon followed. It. I heard a crash as the wood of the bridge caught fire. The flames must have been visible for miles. I turned to my car and drove slowly. There's no need to rush. Everyone who could see was now trapped on the other side. I was sure that I would be far away before they realized their position. By the time dawn broke, I was already pulling off the highway to the gas station. I filled up the SUV and left the empty can at the pumps. Someone will definitely pick it up. With her, the only connection between the fire and me will disappear. I returned the SUV around 9 a.m. and picked up my car. I showered again and dressed casually for the office. I had two more small things to do to end my relationship with Countryman Real Estate. Bernie was a good boss, but forgetful. He often called me to pick up something he forgot in his office. I had keys to every door and every filing cabinet. Gabe was a careful and meticulous person when it came to his office and personal belongings. He had a large new Mahoney desk with a built-in safe. Unfortunately for him, he kept the combination in a folder marked security. It was in a locked closet, but I had the key thanks to Bernie. Twenty minutes after entering the countryman office, I took the password diary from Gabe's safe and entered the company's personal account. It would have been easy to walk away and take everything, but that was not my plan. Stealing will bring me nothing but jail time. I simply transferred the operating account to another one. When I first started working for Countryman, we set up a trust account for deposits. With each new project, a new trust account was created, a state requirement. The original trust account was long forgotten. The previous account was recorded in the archives but not in the ledgers. It was an empty account until I put almost 20 million into it. I transferred all our cash and increased our line of credit just in case. My actions may seem like an empty gesture. Nothing was stolen. Everything was in place. But it will take several days to find and return this money. Early Tuesday morning, electronic funds transfers will land in an empty transaction account. Hundreds of payments will be canceled. I wasn't sure how much damage would be done, but we always owed the banks more than we had. We existed on credit. Take away that credit and times will be tough, at least for a while. Countrymen will have to work hard to regain a good credit rating. The longer the shortage lasts, the bigger the problem becomes. With any luck, Gabe will still be in the mountains on Tuesday.
I'll leave because my next action, after I've got everything in place, will be to print my resignation letter. I was about to leave the office, placing my resignation letter on Gabe's secretary's desk, when my cell phone rang. I looked at my phone, and a photo of Gloria appeared on the screen. I ignored the call. A moment later, the voicemail rang. I shouldn't have listened, but I did. Baby, where are you? They say the car is missing. I'm very worried. Call me, said the wife. In about half an hour, the phone rang again. It was Gabe. Hey, Lyle, are you okay, buddy? Gloria is very worried. Call her. Right now. At the end, I sensed a slight threat. This brought a smile to my face. On Sunday, there were three more calls from Gloria and two from Gabe. He was more threatening on the second call, demanding that I call him back. On Monday morning, I went to pick up the children from Gloria's parents. As I was leaving, Gloria called me again. Lily, I'll be back tonight. We need to talk. If you receive this message, please call. I'm very worried. This is childish, she said. I was sure she wouldn't come back. When I arrived at her parents, they were already waiting for me. Gloria called and said you might be alone to pick up the kids, her mother said. You need to call her son, the father said. She says she'll be back this evening. I think it's best if I wait until then. There are some things we need to work out personally. I wasn't going to get into a discussion with my relatives if I could avoid it. My relatives were not happy, but there was little they could do. My daughter realized something was wrong, but I told her, This is an adult issue between your mother and I. And to be fair to her, we should wait until she comes back to discuss it. After getting the kids home and getting comfortable, I went to our former bedroom and called Felix Rodriguez. Hey, Lyle, how are you? He asked, answering. Not so good, Felix. I need your services, I said. Felix was the best family lawyer I have ever known. He was good both as a lawyer and as a man. Oh, what's the problem? He said. I need to file for divorce. Under no circumstances should you joke about such things. This is the case. Gloria has an affair with Gabriel Zillo. You know, my boss. Crap. I'm truly sorry. What should I do? Felix and I discussed this for about an hour on the phone. I made an appointment for late Tuesday afternoon to get the process started. Phone calls continued to come from the mountain. Apparently, her parents called her. The messages were conciliatory. Gloria alternated with Gabe. Now, there are no threats. Hey, guy, if I made a mistake, I apologize. I don't want what happened this weekend to affect our working relationship. It would be bad for everyone, if you know what I'm getting at, he said. Then around five in the afternoon. Lyle, Lyle, please call. Something happened here. There is no bridge. We're all trapped. Call. I need to talk to you, the wife said. First thing Tuesday morning, I called Stephen Pender, my old companion. We agreed to meet for lunch at a modest diner in one of the shopping centers. Are you sure about this? Stephen asked between bites of his pepper jack tuna sandwich. Already done. I have officially resigned, I said. As if to underline this fact, I received a call from Donna, my secretary at Countryman. Lyle, they say you resigned, but you have to come. Everything here is going to hell. Something is very wrong, Donna said. Sorry, I cannot. I don't work there anymore. I suggest you call Gabe. They say he's stuck in the mountains. Something about a bridge. Eh, sorry to hear that. Well, don't worry. I'm sure everything will work out in the end. Something I should know about? Steve asked. No, this doesn't concern me anymore, I said. Well, if you're confident, I think I can improve my last offer by 10000 a year. If you can start right now. Isn't tomorrow too early? No, that would be great, Steve said. On Wednesday morning, I started working at Pander and Partners. I had just begun to settle in on Wednesday afternoon when I had a visitor. Where is my money? You're an asshole, Gabe Zelo said. What kind of money are you talking about? Well, you know, operating funds. Sorry, but perhaps you should talk to the company accountants. If I do this, I'll sue you for embezzlement, he said. I just smiled at him. He found a way to get down from this mountain, but where are the operational means? 
You think you're some kind of wise lawyer, but you're just an asshole who can't satisfy his wife. She really had a good time with me and I will caress her whenever I am in the mood, he said and ran out. The next day I received a call from the police. They called and asked me to come to the station to answer some questions. Sorry, I just started a new job. My time is very limited, but I can freely answer your questions in writing and I will call you back. The officer who called tried to explain that they don't do that, but I immediately explained that I am a lawyer, and I do everything in writing or not at all. We walked in circles for a few minutes, and then he hung up. I knew the police would have to verify the embezzlement charge before they could act. This would mean tracing the money. I expected them to find the money in the company account where I deposited it a few days ago. This should all end there. After that, it will simply be a civil matter, and an unsuccessful one at best. I was wrong. It took them two weeks to find the missing funds. By then, the countryman was in very serious trouble. Its credit has been completely closed by the banks and will require an injection of new capital to reopen it. Gloria showed up late Friday evening with both of our suitcases from the trip. Her key didn't work because I changed the locks. I met her at the door. She didn't look very good. Please, Lyle. Let me in. If not for me, then think about the children, she said. No, I won't let you in, because you don't live here anymore. I parked your car on the street. I assume you still have the car keys, I said. Do you hate me that much? Yes, I said, and closed the door. I decided that she would go to her parents. I asked Felix to serve her with a restraining order and file a petition for divorce. The few days of respite that the bridge gave me paid big dividends. Felix forbade her to come near me, and I received temporary custody of the children. It took her two months and probably every cent she could scrape to get her to get into the swing of things. By then, the divorce was already in full swing, and all we had to do was work out the details. Gabe Zillow was not so lucky. Countryman Real Estate was forced to close its doors. He stopped doing business immediately after Labor Day. The following week, I had a visitor. He was sitting in the visitor's chair when I returned from closing the third deal. He was deeply tanned and looked quite healthy. He was lightly dressed for the early northern autumn. Bernie, how are you? I asked. I'm fine, he said, craning his neck to look around my meager office. What brought you to the cold north? I asked, feeling that this was not a random visit. Well, here's the thing. Uh, okay. Florida is infested with sharks, and very few of them are in the water. I thought it best to go back to what I know, he said. Oh, I think it's good that you're back, I said, not knowing what else to say to his confession or what he wanted from me. Bernie read the question in my eyes. I dropped a good chunk of cash there. I'll have to start over and start small, but it looks like I'm lucky. This company I own seems to be affordable, he said, a smile touching his face. I looked at him and smiled back. We both stopped laughing. So what do you want from me, old pirate? Well, here's the thing. I need a partner. At my age, bankers believe that any business I start will have no continuity. And, well, you and I would make a good team. So what do you say? I have very little money. You may have heard that I'm going to get a divorce, I said. Yes, I heard, he said. I wonder how much he heard. The story spread quickly. Look, why don't I give you 10%, he said. 50. Be reasonable, you just said you have no money. I bet you do too. But I will agree to 45%, I said. Look, 25% is fair. But this is not enough. 40% and an option to buy another 10% in 10 years. Okay, I just hope I live to see it, said the man who I knew was going to attend my funeral. Bernie and I are back in business. We bought every lot Countryman owned at a discount from the banks, who were now holding them using the same bank's money. I thought it would be difficult for us, but we soon had a very strong business building and selling houses. Life moved on as usual, and so did my divorce. It was mostly a custody and visitation battle. We ended up developing a complex joint custody and visitation system. That's why I came home to a dark and empty house on Christmas Eve. Gloria took the children for Christmas. I was supposed to get them for Christmas. Since Christmas was on a Sunday, 
They had to return to her place on Monday, which was her day off. The kids couldn't stand this kind of routine. As I approached the house, I saw a figure sitting on the steps. She was sheltered from the cold and light falling snow. I was next to her before I recognized my ex-wife. Gloria, what are you doing here? I asked. She didn't look very good. She was even thinner than the last time I saw her, and her eyes seemed empty and indifferent. She had clearly cried at some point in the recent past. I want to go home, she moaned. Where are the children? I asked, ignoring her plea. With my parents. They also want to return home. We want to be a family again in our little house. What you did to us is unfair. I didn't do anything like that. Well, yes, that's true. I made a mistake. Okay, it was a bad and offensive mistake, but it was just one mistake. It was you who destroyed our family, she accused, and anger could be heard in her voice. She made a conscious effort to calm down. I told myself I wouldn't lose my temper, but please understand I have anger issues over this, she said. You have anger problems. I was amazed. Don't pretend to be innocent. You're not like that at all. Did you just happen to be ahead of everyone else? I'm not stupid, Lyle. You were never a saint. I know I hurt you, but that was never my intention. Do you really expect me to believe that you thought having sex with another man right in front of me wouldn't hurt me? I said. She turned away. My words obviously hurt him deeply. I saw her wiping her eyes with her hands, although now her back was to me. It was clear that she was crying. I was always the fat one, the last one to be invited to dance, and I had to accept the one who asked. I was a good girl, so I spent a lot of time fending off rude attacks. I waited all through high school and most of college for the right person. When I met you, I realized that I had found the right man. I was a virgin when we got married. I didn't make a big deal out of it, but I thought you knew. You are not a prince now, and you certainly weren't then. You were an ordinary guy. But I loved you with all my heart. Yes, you were a little smarter than the others and a little more ambitious, but we were always broke. I learned to live with lower expectations because I loved you. It hurt me to see you struggling so hard. Then Gabriel came along and everything seemed to get better. He had everything a woman needs in a man. This time the prince wanted me. It was very flattering. After the Christmas party, he kept calling me. It wasn't serious, just flirting. You know, beautiful women get things like this all the time. It's not that I haven't been pestered, but not by people from the beautiful, powerful elites. He said nice things about you and how lucky I am to have such a wonderful boyfriend like you. I bet he just fucking loved me, I said. Exactly. He said how hard you work and how he wants to reward you. I knew what he was saying. If I'm nice to him, he'll take care of you. I guess I let him convince me that you would win if I gave in to him. It's true as is the fact that I wanted him. It was as if there was some crazy sound in my head that was leading me to him. I was torn between hoping that something would happen this weekend and being afraid that it would. Once we got there, all my resistance began to fade away. I turned to you. I did it. I asked you, What? Are you joking? You told me you would go to bed with him. Okay, okay. I didn't say it directly, but you knew what was going on and you didn't say no she said, turning to me. Tears streamed down her cheeks and dripped from her chin. Her nose was running. I believed in you. As I said, we lived together that night for 16 years. How could you do this to me, I said. But that's the point. We loved each other. It was just a fling. Nothing compared to what we had before and what we will have after. Are you so crazy that you believe that after hearing you scream in pleasure for him, we can have anything we want. Oh, damn, you can't be that stupid. It was all a sham. I wanted to be good for him. I put on quite a show. Such people need and expect it. I never act like that in bed, and you should know that after 16 years of making love to me. I only know what you did. How you humiliated me. You took the golden boy instead of me. The jerk who gives nothing and takes everything. Powerful, isn't it? So where is he now? What happened when the crisis came? I'll tell you everything. He folded his hands. We live in a society that maintains the power of the few over the many on the myth of some secret genius they possess. 
Tell me, how did the genius manage to go down the mountain so quickly? He called a helicopter. By then, he already knew that you had done something with the business. It was very obvious that you had burned the bridge. He thought you stole his money. The others began to panic. Paula insisted that this could not be true, that it couldn't work like that. When the helicopter arrived, there was only room for Gabe. The rest quit. I believe the National Guard eventually set up a temporary bridge to save us. Sharon and I got back together. By then, her husband already knew the truth. She got into trouble just like me. Poor Robin's fiancé broke off the engagement. Glenn and Ken both got into trouble, but I think they got out of it with Paula's help. I think it was only Gabe and us regular people who really bore the brunt. But wasn't the pain enough? She asked, looking at me hopefully. There was a lot of truth in Gloria's words. I wasn't entirely innocent. I worked for Gabe. But unlike the rest of the world, I never put myself with him. I knew the truth, but I refused to admit it to myself. I can't get past how it happened. They contain nothing but false promises. If you look closely, you can see a trap. But no one looked. Illusion is much better than reality. We fought through difficult times and they passed with time. What you and Gabe took from me was the safety of my home. I will never be able to recover this because those bastards proved that what I believed in was an illusion. You and I were an illusion. Having said this, I stood up and headed towards the door of the dark and empty house. She refused to give up. Answer me this, she said. Would you rather be alone without me? Or would you rather be with me and our children at the Christmas tree tonight? I looked at her. It would be so easy to take her into your arms, love her, take the children home to sleep in their own home on Christmas Eve, and pretend that what happened never happened. But all I could say was, that's a good question, but I don't have an answer to it. With those words, we turned away from each other. What is in our past cannot be changed. We must live for our future. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.